Okay, well this week we're going to be talking about a large scale question about the nature of business overall and the ethical justification for a system of business. Next week we're going to be considering various critiques of that. So between the two we're going to look at, I guess I've entitled it on the syllabus, the case for capitalism and then critiques of capitalism. I think those large scale questions are important in a general way. They force us to confront issues in not only ethics but also <laughs> political philosophy and economics. But in addition to that, they affect what goes on in business in various ways. So for example, um, you will often hear people talk about wanting to give back to the community. And people who write about corporate social responsibility often have that sort of attitude. Well, that implies a picture of business taking from the community and having to do something special to give back. But what if that's not right, the right picture at all? What if business is actually contributing to the community all the way along? That changes one's conception of the nature of social responsibilities and also of the ethics of business itself. Similarly, if you, I mean, look at it this way. If business itself were an unethical enterprise, then having a course on business ethics would be like having a course on the ethics of bank robbery, right? I mean, that would be weird. We don't do that. Why? Well, because we think, look, um, the only winning move there ethically is not to play. Don't start robbing banks. But in the case of business, very few people argue that business itself is in some way immoral. On the other hand, they often argue that it can become so under certain conditions and that you've got to be careful about those boundaries. But where are those boundaries? What are those boundaries? It's important that we understand that to even understand the big picture, let alone what happens when we look at specific things like conflicts of interest or other things within the context of an organization that might pose ethical problems. So this week and next, we're going to look at those large scale questions and then we'll turn to more specific things. Now, before we do that, I want to focus on some general definitions. These terms are things that get used a lot and it will be helpful for us to pin down some definitions. Not everybody uses them with these kinds of things in mind, but I think it's, it captures most people's usage and it's helpful so that we know what we're talking about. You might say the beginnings of the free market occur whenever two people think, gosh, you have something I would like. In fact, there's a nice little cartoon that I've seen, which has, I should put this up on the web page actually, that has two cavemen encountering one another. One is holding a rock, the other is holding a stick. The guy with the rock says, gee, I wish I had a stick. And the other one says, gee, I wish I had a rock. And it's the beginning of free market economics. Well, that is sort of what it's involved, right? Each person thinks I would be better off with that. And so they make a trade with the idea that both end up better off. Now, that in itself doesn't require any particular system. This is something that can go on in elementary school. I don't know about you, but you know, at lunches, we would trade things. We were little budding economists, I guess, <laughs> or business people. It's like, I, I was in a good position because I love certain kinds of vegetables that nobody else in my elementary school liked. So peas, like, Oh, yes, I'll trade, you know, hey, I've got a brownie. Can I, I'll give you my brownie for your peas. This was my, th or your, my role, and yeah, other students thought I was insane. But, you know, a couple of people would make these trades, so I'd have this big mountain of peas. And then other people would say, like, well, I hate peas. Here, just take my peas for free. <laughs> so uh, we did a lot of trading like that. Both sides ended up feeling like they were better off. Now, how did all that happen? sort of go. Well, you might say it didn't require any system. It didn't require anything like a business. I didn't have a business of collecting peas. I just liked them and we made these trades informally. But free enterprise as a system goes beyond that. A system of free enterprise is something that not only includes such free exchanges and it's important, we'll come back to this question of what free means here. <clears throat> but it requires a certain kind of system. Now, what has to be in place to have a system of free enterprise? What's required for business even to exist to get beyond that informal level of trading? Yeah. Good. One thing we'll need is something like money, some mode of exchange. We didn't have that in my elementary school. Nobody was, I wasn't buying peas from anyone. 
It was simply a, an informal barter system. But in a real system of business, we need something that serves as money. We need some medium of exchange. What else do we need? Good, we need property rights. And even more generally, you might say, we need the rule of law. If we don't have those, then you're right. You could trade and have somebody immediately bop you on the head and take it back, right? So that's not going to work. Now, these things are important. My next door neighbor for a while was serving as, he was a lawyer who specialized in oil and gas law. He went to Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union to help them set up such a system. One time he came home for Christmas and got a call saying, don't come back. <laughs> Why? Because the Russian mafia had moved into the oil fields where he was working and taken it all over. And Russia, at that point at least, was a country where property rights weren't respected, where there wasn't rule of law, where a group of people could simply come in and say, we're taking your stuff, we're in charge now. We don't want a system of law, don't help us set that up. Our whole way of operating is to operate outside any law. And when that happens, of course, you don't have anything like a free enterprise system. Now, nobody knows really who owns anything. There's a sense in which nobody does have ownership. They simply have possession. And so those things are surely needed. Now, is there anything else that's needed? Oh, good. Yes, we have to have the rule of law. And that does mean we're going to have to have a system of legal institutions. Suppose something does go wrong. You better have some way of redressing that. You have to have someone to enforce this. And of course, that means you're going to have to have some enforcement mechanism when people violate the law. Um, you're going to have to have something like a judicial system to correct these injustices. You will have to have some way of enforcing these things. If, after all, we have in our constitution, let's say, the right to property, but then it's routinely ignored and there's nothing you can do if people steal your stuff, then you might as well not have it at all. So you're absolutely right. We need a system of legal institutions to enforce those things, to make sure that's not just on paper, but really exists in that society. Well, I think that's characteristic of a free enterprise economy. There are free economic exchanges within a system, within a structure where we have money, we have property rights, in general, the rule of law, and we have institutions to help us enforce the rule of law. People talk a lot about capitalism, but capitalism goes beyond that. Capitalism is a system that includes all of that, but now adds something to it. What is capital in the economic sense? Yeah, OK, good. Um, financial values, we need financial institutions too. Capitalism is an institution that arose um, basically in the Renaissance, and how, what, what made it possible? <laughs> it was a way of accumulating large amounts of money. So you might say capital is really just an asset. It's just money, it's just, yes, maybe goods and services, maybe uh, money you have, <laughs> maybe it's just, you know, uh, a sort of personality you have that aspects, that is a kind of social capital. But really, the key here for capitalism as a system is having institutions that can allow for the accumulation of large amounts of money. Now, before that, it was very hard for anything outside of the church or the government to accumulate enough money to do much of anything. However, under capitalism, lots of people can band together and actually put their capital, their investment funds together. And so what you need, in addition to all of this, are financial institutions. You need institutions that allow you to accumulate amounts of money to make it possible for people to do things that they couldn't do on their own. So what does that mean? Well, I have in mind banks, insurance companies, which in a sense grew out of the age of exploration and the need to you know, finance ships that were going on very dangerous journeys. Um, and then what else? Uh, stock markets. So if we talk about capitalism, part of what we mean is a system of free enterprise like this, but partly what we mean is <laughs> something that is supplemented by the existence of those institutions for accumulating large amounts of money. 
Um, without these, you might say, you still have things happening at a very low level, but you don't really have the ability for people to build factories, for them to send ships <laughs> overseas, for them to do the kinds of things that are required for an advanced society. Well, that really is just a question of definitions. Now let's turn to the question of how this can be justified. Um, are antitrust laws always anti-capitalist? Well, here is why you might think <laughs> there's a tension between these things, and it seems to me the answer to that is somewhat unclear. There are people who would answer yes and say yes they are because the whole point is to be able, able to accumulate things and create large institutions. However, we have to think mm, two things. First of all, this is free enterprise and we've talked about free exchanges. What do we mean by that exactly? Now, that's a contentious issue but, and we'll come back to it. But for now, let's talk about that a little bit. When is something free? John Stuart Mill in On Liberty gives three criteria for something constituting a, a free action of an agent as opposed to, well, something else, something that is not quite free, is coerced maybe, and so on. He says in order for an action to be free, first of all, it has to be voluntary. You have to mean to do it. So if I do something inadvertently, and you say, well, you, you know, that was a free choice of yours. You can say, no, it wasn't. It wasn't even a choice of mine. I didn't voluntarily do it. Um, it could be something trivial, like maybe I sneeze, or maybe I knock something over. Um, I didn't voluntarily do that. I wasn't trying to do it. But it could also be that I didn't foresee the effects of something. And so it's like, no, I, I didn't mean to do that. That was not a free choice of mine. So that one is kind of trivial. But the second one is more important. It is uncoerced. So nobody's forcing me to do it, okay? I had the choice to do otherwise. And so, I mean, suppose the thief comes up and points a gun at me and says, give me the money in your wallet, and I do it. Is that a free exchange? <laughs> no, he had a gun pointed at me, okay? Um, and so in that case, you might say, well, I, I mean, I could have done otherwise. Jean-Paul Sartre says, look, every, every action is free. You could always do otherwise. Um, you could just say no. Um, and who knows, you might get away with it. Um, I don't know if you've seen this video. It's marvelous of a guy who is in a bar drinking a beer and smoking a cigarette. And this thief comes in and he has a gun and he demands that everybody give them their money, give them their watch, their, you know, and rings and so on. This guy just sits there at the bar, ignoring all of this. Everybody else is panicking, running around, or hitting the floor. Uh, and this guy's just sitting there, smoking a cigarette, drinking his beer. <laughs> and he ignores all of it. And the guy finally comes over and says, you know, give me your stuff. The guy just looks at him and says, no. <laughs> Keeps going. <laughs> the robber doesn't know what to do. Finally, he just leaves. He leaves the guy alone. And he just sat there the whole time, not acting nervous. It's, you know, the friends of mine on Facebook who posted this just said, wow. You might be cool, but nobody's as cool as that guy. He just sits there and ignores it all happening around him. Anyway, but still, there's force involved here, right? And we would say that if you actually give the guy your money, um, that's not a free action of yours. It's being coerced. And the third thing is that you must be informed. You must know what you're doing. And so, if you are deceived or if you are coerced, that's a problem. So what are the main difficulties here? What are the main constraints that lead the rule of law here to go beyond just a respect for property rights? First of all, we've got to have a rule that says, look, no coercion. People shouldn't be forced into things. And secondly, <laughs> there's, there should be no fraud. Now, how is this relevant to the antitrust question? Because some people argue, well, wait a minute. If something becomes so large that I have no real choice, I have to use this, somebody has monopoly power, let's say, then really I am being coerced. I don't have a choice. I couldn't do otherwise. Sometimes there are natural monopolies and we allow that, but then we tend to regulate those monopolies. We might do that with the water company, for example, 
or maybe with the electric company or uh, a variety of other things like that that are basic utilities. But otherwise, if something grows large enough, you might say, wait a minute, it really now leaves people no choice. And in such circumstances, there's a question of whether now exchanges taking place are free. Um, it's not clear exactly where the line is, but just try avoiding Google, for example, <laughs> right now. Pretty difficult, right? Um, it pops up everywhere. Uh, and you might say, gosh, yeah. Uh, and indeed, some people in Washington are starting to get worried about that, saying, wait a minute, a few companies have so much power that um, you don't really have much of a choice. Yeah, you can use another search engine, but it's going to creep in in all sorts of other ways. And so, in short, that becomes the issue. So that's why I say it's somewhat unclear. How we define coercion and having a choice becomes tricky. When we say a monopoly is morally okay and when it would be objectionable, that's something we have to fight about. Um, people tend to agree about certain things, but, for example, Austin has its own electric utility, Austin and Energy, uh, San Antonio does too, but in most of Texas, things are not done that way. It's private companies. And so there are all sorts of places where we look at the boundary and we say, you know, is it okay for this to be a monopoly or is this objectionable? And how much of the market do you have to take over before we declare it a monopoly um, and think that people now aren't acting in a way that they have a choice? Um, those are tricky questions we'll have to consider later, but great question.